what doesn't kill you makes you blacker. I just think right now in this moment, it's just the kind of uh, healing commentary that we need. Of course, you know, you couldn't predict what would be happening right now, but how do you think this feel, that this book fits, uh, this title, the themes in this book for where we are right now, man? I mean, I, I feel like the, the, the contents of the book are evergreen, right? You know, because it, it deals with blackness, obviously, and deals with um, race, racism, but it also deals with anxiety, with self-consciousness, with performance, with, um, with uh, angst, um, and, and all these other, you know, functions that, that go into this, that go into this making you a human, human being. But, um, but particularly today, you know, since America has discovered racism <laughs> and discovered <laughs> that it's, it's time to just care figure about it out. Racism. <laughs> yeah, just, fig- just figure right. it out after 400, after 400 years. It's like, oh, I guess racism right. does exist. Um, yes. and, so, and so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the book is especially relevant now um, just because it, it provides a context for, for what white supremacy can do to a person. And, and right now, you know, I, I feel like a lot of America's chickens are coming home to roost because mm-hmm. you're seeing, you know, particularly with COVID, that, that white lives, individual white lives don't even matter as much as white supremacy does mm. where white supremacy will sacrifice white people too, mm-hmm. will sacrifice white lives too in mm. order to, in order to retain its status in order, in order to retain its relevance, its power, its strength or whatever. And, and we see that each time there's some mass shooting at a predominantly white high school, you know, the, the one that really, you know, that, that, so if there's any shooting that should have changed things, that should have woken America Sandy up, Hook. it was Sandy Hook. Yeah, Sandy yes. Hook. And you have these, you know, these six-year-olds, five-year-olds, teachers, and that didn't do any. That didn't move. I mean, it moved needles on, on one end, but in terms of the NRA, in terms of Republicans, it didn't. It it didn't affect them. It's like, well, these are. These kids are collateral damage because our freedom and this freedom is indistractable from this notion of whiteness, this notion of white supremacy. Those two things are interlinked. They can't be divorced from each other. And so it's almost like if you take away the freedom, then you take away the whiteness too. Mm. Yo, that's, and you see that throughout history. If you look at certain moments in history, you will see that white people are willing to sacrifice other white people in the name of white supremacy. And the, and the folks who are being sacrificed don't even see it coming. If you're just tuning in, we're talking to Damon Young. The book, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. You got to check it out. All right. So one of my favorite parts of the book is you talk about people <laughs> throughout your life sometimes thinking that you were gay. And I love this. I think it's so important, especially for black men, to talk about this. I think what really fans the flames of homophobia is these standards of masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. And then straight guys, just talk about straight black men for a minute. They'll get paranoid that they're being put into this box that really isn't the realistic box for gay people, especially black gay people, right? And I was like, I'm so happy he's breaking this down because... This might may sound like a, a, a trivial thing, but I remember at what one point, I don't watch it anymore, that, that TV show, Real Housewives of Atlanta, one of the main insults they would say is, I think he's gay. Look at the way he walked. Oh, he doesn't want me. He's got to be gay. And I'm like, y'all act like you're an ally, whatever that means, but that's the main insult you throw out. So this I just thought was so interesting about the standards of masculinity and how it affects gay men and straight men. And you just being a nerdy guy, you were put in a box. I just thought it was really brilliant. If you can just speak to that. Yeah. And so it's, so the, 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 the title of the chapter is No Homo, right? And just give yeah. a bit of context for that. If you grew up um, in, the, in like the late 90s, early aughts, No Homo was a phrase that people would use after any sort of sentence or whatever that had any perceived homoerotic undertones. So you could say something like Patrick Ewing 
Patrick Ewing has some long ass arms. No homo. And 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 then it, and then it became like a thing that became like this ironic joke, where you would say something that was intentionally, you know, that that had very intentional homoerotic undertones, just to say that following, and it would be a joke. And you know, as we know, ironic homophobia is still homophobia, right? Mm-hmm. And and that that no homo thing, I guess, has evolved a bit. Where the kids nowadays say pause. Apparently, I have a eighteen year old nephew and a 19 year old brother-in-law. So I, I listen to them talk sometimes and correct them. But, um, and so yeah, the idea of performance because, so I was a college athlete. I played, I was a star basketball player in high school, went to college on a basketball scholarship. And so if you're a black, straight black male athlete in a sport that people actually give a fuck about, <laughs> you're, there's a certain um, expectation of who you're supposed to be of how you're supposed to engage with people, of how you're supposed to treat women, of how many um, women you're supposed to sleep with. And that, that, that expectation was never really me. But I feel the gap from the reality. I feel the gap um, between the reality and expectation with performance. And mm. this sort of you know, ironic homophobia is one of those performances. And it's one of those performances that I felt I, I, that I needed to portray in order to achieve some standard of masculinity that no one actually reaches. That no one actually, like no one, like no one is John Shaft. Like John Shaft is a fictional character. (laughs) No one, no one is that. But, you know, we're trying to reach this ideal because we feel like, okay, this is how you're supposed to be a man. This is how you're supposed to walk. This is who and how many women are supposed to sleep with. And and that can be just this self-fulfilling, you know, this self-fulfilling um, prophecy of like a paralyzation where you just, just put yourself in these smaller boxes, right? Because, you know, the world is already going to try to put you in a box. And then you put yourself in a box and the box gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you don't have any room to breathe. And, 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 you know, when you look at our rates of, you know, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, and all, all these, you know, these things that, that, and I'm talking specifically about heterosexual black men deal with. Yes, a lot of that is due to white supremacy. And, and white supremacy is the, is, is, the, is the atmosphere that we all exist in. And our reaction to that atmosphere has been to embrace sometimes this this very toxic, I don't know, performance. And that toxic performance kills us. Like if the police don't kill us, then the high blood pressure will. 